on the theme of challenges and strategies of social solidarity economy in times of COVID-19 crisis. As you already may know already, um, according to the WHO, uh, by June 8 at 4 p.m., there are more than 6,931,853 people who are affected with more than 480,857 dead people. And this COVID pandemic is affecting more than 216 countries, which has caused unprecedented health and sanitation crisis, but not only the public health crisis, but more importantly, a, a never seen social economic crisis causing a lot of pains and sufferings to the humankind. According to the ILO, there might be more than 305 million employment lost just in last two months period of time. So this webinar, Challenges and Strategies of Social Solidarity Economy in Times of COVID-19 Crisis is part of GCEF webinar series co-organized with the Local Organizing Committee of GCEF 2021 for preparing our virtual forum to be held in October 2020. The series between May till September illustrate the major impact of COVID-19 on social solidarity economy and also our societies and economies and the responses which have been developed by the social solidarity economy organizations in terms of the creative actions undertaken by local government as well as social solidarity stakeholders in the fight against COVID-19. So um, today's webinar is our last series of uh, first round on challenges and strategies of social solidarity economy in times of COVID-19. We already had uh, the first one in French on May 26th and the second webinar in Spanish organized on June 3rd with more than uh, eight, uh, 980 people uh, connected from different uh, North and Latin American countries. And this is going to be the last uh, webinar in this series in English. We have very prominent speakers from different countries. Actually, they are five. We have very first speaker who is the Mr. Jia Zhuan, founder of Star of Social in Innovation from China. He will be just connecting with us. And then our second speaker is Ms. Lynn Collins, Strategic Relations and Engagement Advisor from the River Pacific Region Combined Authority in the UK. Our third speaker is Ms. Nonhele Memela, Program Manager of the Etakini Municipality in South Africa. And our fourth speaker is Mr. Juyeon Cho. He is the CEO of Seoul Social Economy Center in South Korea. And our last but not the least speaker, Mr. Anthony Young. He is the Business Director of the Hong Kong Council of Social Service from Hong Kong, um, which is also part of China. Okay, I just got a very good news that Mr. Jia Juan, he is connected with us. So um, before we invite him, that I would like to give a few um, indicators, indications to our participants. As I said that we have five speakers, so we will have um, these five presentations one by one without having Q&A section after each speaker's presentation. But at the end of our webinar, we will have Q&A section. So if you do have any questions that you would like to put to the speakers who have just shared their presentation, please use the Q&A uh, chat bar at the at the, at the bottom of this, uh, this window, and you can um, write your question and we will try to respond, or we will try to invite to ask the question at the end of the presentation. 
Please, all the participants, mute your video and speaker to avoid any background noise during the section. And if you would like to get engaged with the others and introduce yourself, please use the chat and leave your uh, name and your organization and also greet with each other. Please do not use Q&A to introduce and, and engage with others. Q&A chat bar, bar is only to ask questions to the speakers. So without taking much more time, I would like to invite our very first speaker, Mr. Jia Zhuan, who is the founder of China Social Enterprise Certification Service Platform, which is a very important promoter of social enterprise in China. And he's also the founder of Shenzhen Star of Social Innovation, the very first social enterprise development promotion center. Mr. Jia is keen on facilitating resource allocation for social missions. He has extensive working experience in, in the promotion of social solidarity economy and charity establishment and operation of legal entities, such as non-governmental organizations, foundations, and enterprise. Mr. Jia, if you are connected, floor is yours. Hello, hello. Yes, we hear you. Please go ahead. Uh, all the participants, he's going to speak in Chinese. So please, if you don't understand Chinese, uh, on the, at the bottom, on the right side, you will see with the globe interpretation. And please choose English. Uh, please. Mr. Jua, floor is yours. <laughs> Mr. Jia? Hello, I'm okay. Okay, yeah, he, he's, he's Sorry. Okay. Please understand because he he's participating in in one of the conference. He just came out from the conference to be with us. Now can I speak? Yeah, yeah, you can speak. Okay, thank you. Please Sorry. go ahead. Sorry, I'm meeting now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, 我今天跟大家分享的话题是来自于疫情下的中国社会企业。呃，我的主题叫做善见未来。呃，在分享之前，非常感恩感谢我们GSEF能够邀请我代表中国的社会企业能够向世界来去介绍，在疫情期间我们所采取的一些行动，或者我们遇到的一些困题，呃，一些问题以及我们因此而产生的一些这个
、住房的居住改善、文化体育与艺术等等这十六个。我们在这十六个领域之内，主要的十六个领域之内去发现和培育我们的中国的社会企业。同时，我们对我们在国中国的这样的社会企业服务的人群，也做了这样的一个特定的人群的划分，十四类人群，包括残障人群、少数民族，呃，特定群体、特定的失业者群体、弱势儿童等等，就是我们现在可以大家可以在我们的 PPT 上可以看到的。哦 ，OK， 可以看到的。也就是说，这个人群和我们联合国呃 SDG 所关注。Sorry, Mr. G. R. Because I think we were not getting、uh, English interpretation, and we have just asked the interpreter to change uh, her uh, speaker line, and now I think it's getting much better. So,、uh, sorry, could you just repeat what you have just said? Okay, now this 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 paper, I repeat. Yeah. 下次，张先生要由头再开始一遍，从头吗？因为刚才没有英文的翻译，对，从头不好意思，因为他们听不到。啊、哦，不好意思，那好吧。呃、不好意思，特别没有英文，他们听不到。好，现在可以了。现在可以了是吗 ？OK， 大家好，我给大家今天分享的这个主题是来自于疫情下的中国社会企业所采取的行动和面临的挑战。我的主题分享叫做“善见未来”。OK, next. Let's start well, again. Yeah, I, I'm Stein. Is I'm Stein now. I'm repeat. Uh、mm、huh. -hmm. Yeah, we hear you. We hear you. Please go ahead. Mr. Xia, please go ahead. 我来自于中国社会企业服务平台，简称 CSESC， 是在中国最早也是唯一开展社会企业认证培育孵化的这样的一个专业的机构。我们负责北京、成都，包括整个行业的社会企业企业的认证，这是我们在 NGO 板块的。同时，我们也也有一家，呃，这个社会企业是专注于。社会企业、社会领域的数据和影响力管理的这样的一个专门的企业，我们为社会企业提供战略、成长、培育、数据和科技的赋能，这是我们在做的。今天的主题会跟大家分享，如何我们的中国的社会企业如何在疫情的挑战下，我们的困难以及应对。首先 ，next 下一页，下一页，我们首先将我们的中国的社会企业做了领域和人群的划分。我们在中国将社会企业分成了十六大领域，也就是咱呃大家现在看到的这十六大领域的分类，无论是农村发展、社区、无障碍、养老，对于人群服务的人群，我们也做了特别的划分，十四类的人群：残障、少数民族、失业人群、弱势群、弱势儿童、贫困群体等等。我们对中国的社会企业去做了这样的这个划分，人群做的划分。Mr. C. 嗯 ，If uh I think that um still there is no English translation following from your speech, so we would like to check with the interpreter once again. Could you just uh、oh. wait for about ten、uh, minutes? We will change the order of the、uh, speaking. Uh, I would like to invite our second speech speaker while we are trying to solve this problem with the interpreter. Is that okay? Ten minutes. Yeah. Just for ten minutes. Sorry that I know that you just came out from the、uh, judgment of the prize.、Uh, we are、okay. very sorry for that. We we will just try to solve the、uh, translation problem. Okay. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much for your understanding.、Uh, I, I'm very sorry that we are having a problem of、um, Chinese and English translation. Uh, I would like to, while we are trying to solve this problem, I would like to invite our second speaker, Miss Lin Colin, who is the strategic relations、uh, and engagement advisor to the、um, River Plate Region Combined Authority in UK. Lin was appointed as the North West Regional Secretary of the Trade Union Congress in 2013, and this was the 
uh, first time that a uh, woman is holding this position. And his election as the first Metro Mayor of Liverpool City Region in 2017, Steve Rotteram, the Mayor of the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, appointed Rin as a mayoral advisor on equalities and as chair of the Innovative Fairness and Social Justice Advisory Board. In 2019, Lynn became a secondment to the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority where she is supporting work on track, tackling poverty, developing a fair employment charter, and enhancing links with the social solid economies. More recently, Lynn has been working on the city region's response to COVID-19. Ms. Lynn Collins, floor is yours. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, and hopefully I'm coming across loud and clear and I'm sure somebody will tell me as soon as I'm not. Many thanks for the invitation to join you today. And can I begin by sending solidarity to you all in these difficult times when our human instincts to be together to support our communities have been replaced by these virtual chances to share and support. Lawrence has told you a little bit about my role, um, so I won't go into that any further, but there's an indication on this slide on some of the projects I've been working on with the Liverpool City Region over the last year. So, uh, on the challenges currently faced, as we move into the response phase, and as the UK went into lockdown in March, our social and solidarity economy far from closing down, stepped up to the front line. For our socially trading organisations and community businesses, while some did have to physically close their doors, uh, they joined with the Metro Mayor to campaign for those who were self-employed in the sector to receive employment protections, just as those were employed. Um, and for small businesses, uh, it, who worked in shared workspaces to receive the same support as larger businesses in large premises. But we also saw the sector pivoting its business to both survive as a business, but to deliver essential support to our communities. New food delivery services cycle repair and refurbishment projects and maker spaces switching over to the production of personal protective equipment to distribute to residential care homes. And for our community and voluntary sector organisations, well they immediately stepped up to deliver frontline services. Existing organisations who used to open their doors to the community had to rethink how they delivered their services. So youth centres making up packs of essential toiletries for delivery to the young people they support. Domestic abuse support services preparing for the consequences of the government's stay at home message. And the organisations supporting our black Asian and minority ethnic communities dealing with the disproportionately high death rate on top of existing layers of disadvantage and social exclusion. And I want to highlight just a few of the problems that emerged during this response phase. So firstly, Liverpool City Region has a very high proportion of residents for who the medical advice was for them to be shielded. That may, meant staying at home and not leaving for any reason. This created a massive new demand for support with obtaining food and medications, as well as creating new levels of isolation and anxiety amongst this cohort of our population. Secondly, we already had the scandal of the world's sixth richest country having whole communities reliant on the support of food banks for their basic survival. If you add to that the almost 37,000 new claimants for state benefits just in April alone, 
41% up, all of whom would have to wait five weeks for their first payment to be received, then the pressures on the charities in that part of the sector were immense. Thirdly, we knew before COVID that many of our disadvantaged communities were digitally excluded with a lack of physical kit and connectivity. So while the city region had good coverage of super fast broadband, and I hope mine is holding up today, the take up of this is very low amongst disadvantaged communities. And the move to homeschooling, mostly based online, leaves families with limited kit at a huge disadvantage. We've heard anecdotally of large families where children are sharing a parent's smartphone with a data limit on it to try to access online schooling materials. And fourthly, while much of the focus of the impact of COVID itself has been on the older generation, it's become clear that the long-term impact on young people will be huge. Already, apprenticeship opportunities have almost disappeared for those leaving school this summer. And we know the move to teachers predicting the exam grades for this year's students is likely to impact adversely on young people from disadvantaged communities. And that's not to mention the impact of being locked in with your parents for long periods of time without seeing friends and without your normal support networks. Based on our anecdotal observations, our research and evidence team have been looking at the impact on our communities and developed an index based on the factors described on the slide in front of you. We therefore can see how disadvantaged communities are proportionally more disadvantaged by the impact of COVID. And finally, when our national government said to our local governments, you should do whatever it takes to support local communities, we all assumed that funding would follow. But the latest allocations mean that our city region will lose out to the tune of £341 million. The impact, if that's not corrected, will be felt for many years to come. So on the next slide, what have we done to support the social and solidarity economy during the crisis? Well, two instant things. Firstly, for social trading organisations, we have uh, developed an innovation fund called Kindred. The purpose of the fund is to do three things. Firstly, to actively engage local individuals and communities who have ideas to generate community wealth, but who don't yet have an established socially trading organisation, and so do not consider themselves yet to be an entrepreneur. Secondly, to support the long-term transfer of assets, for example, unused council buildings or land from local authorities, uh, that comprise, comprise the combined authority area. And thirdly, to support the long-term benefit that a thriving socially trading sector can have on the whole social economy of Liverpool city region. COVID required urgent actions, so working with the partners of the project from the sector and from sector funding organisations, we brought forward the business support element of the project to provide immediate peer-to-peer -peer support for existing organisations to get through the crisis. As well as a business level support, there are regular kindred conversations online, which have encouraged the sector to sustain itself, to pivot their business if necessary, and to think about the innovation that's needed in a post-COVID environment. And for our community and voluntary organisations, we knew we needed to get help fast to the organisations on the front line supporting communities. So we established, I think within 24 hours of lockdown, LCR Cares, working with our community partners to create a crowdfunding platform and a simple, fast grant-based system for local community organisations. To date, we've distributed over 200 grants, totaling over a million pounds, 
to organisations who've adapted their focus and support for communities, supporting thousands of families going through the crisis. And we've seen an interesting rise in micro volunteering and very hyper local initiatives that our small grants have helped to support. Um, and challenge, I suppose, going forward is to maintain that. So on the next slide, I wanted to touch on just some of the initiatives that will form part of our recovery following our response. And this is built on the premise that we need to use this moment in time to build back better our economy and our society. Before COVID, we were just about to establish the Liverpool City Region Social and Solidarity Economy Reference Panel. And this takes on a new significance in the new times we find ourselves in. The panel is the first step in creating a space for the social and solidarity economy sector to have a stronger voice in our city region, with a view to moving to a system of self-organisation in the sector. Alongside this, we will be establishing the Metro Mayor's Youth Advisory Group to ensure young people remain a focus of our recovery. Thirdly, the crisis has reinforced the vital need for a well-supported, resourced infrastructure to support community and voluntary organisations. The value of that sector is in its diversity, from large, well-established national charities to small, very focused community groups. And we want to speak with a united voice in our city region for all elements of that sector. And finally, our recovery plan, whilst tackling the massive impact of COVID on the economy, should not lose sight of some of the positives that have emerged. So when we build back better, we have to recognise two things. Firstly, the things that we knew were wrong before this even, have been even magnified by this crisis. Communities with multiple disadvantages, digital exclusion, food poverty, and our recovery must tackle them even more. And secondly, the positives we've seen during the crisis must be maintained as we recover. Communities responding fast and in a focused way. Businesses delivering solidarity and support locally. People valuing it, clean air and health and well-being. That's what our recovery has to be built on. And not just one that simply goes back to measuring our worth by GDP and GD GVA. I hope that provides an overview and I look forward to hearing the other contributions and taking any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lynn Collins. This is really very interesting to hear the experience and, and, and effort of the Liverpool uh, region. Um, actually, that um, Actually, that I think um, her, her experience uh, of Liverpool uh, greater region is a very interesting case. Um, as many specialists have said that COVID-19 pandemic has caused not only a greater uh, economic turn down in the developing countries, but also to the most of developed countries where a quite important number of marginalized communities, including women and, and youth are suffering. And I think she has uh, precisely pointed out very well about the challenges uh, which are causing to uh, not only uh, cease trainings and economic activities, but more importantly to the disadvantaged and vulnerable communities. And, and, and this has shown very uh, sharply also a new challenge of digital exclusion to the children and, and also many of those uh, workers from the vulnerable communities. But also it's very uh, interesting and, and even hopeful to hear from uh, Lynn that uh, River City Region is really working on overall strategy with the support of the mayor to build back better means that turning this crisis as an opportunity to do differently and especially through the uh, methodology of social dialogue engaged and connected with the communities 
uh, to develop more sustainable and inclusive local development. I think this is uh, something that I think it came all the way through different uh, our webinar series, uh, whether this is in French, Spanish, and English. I think it's a, it's a very important lesson that we could draw from uh, our experience shared. Thank you, thank you once again to uh, Lynn Collins. And I would like to now uh, call Mr. Jia Zhuan uh, from China. I think now it seems our, uh, I hope the Chinese and English interpretation would work. I think Mr. Jia, uh, floor okay. is yours. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry for the, all the problems caused with the interpretation. Let's hope that we can manage it now. Please go ahead. Hello, I'm Sa Xuan from China Social Enterprise Certification Platform. The topic today is how social enterprise in China faces the COVID-19. The theme is good at seeing the future, China's social enterprises in pandemic. First of all, I would like to have a self-introduction of our office. We are the first and only office that launches service for accrediting social enterprises as a standard in China. We also conduct research and give advices to the government on related policies. You may find ourselves in Chengdu, Beijing, Shenzhen, uh, and, and so on. We also have another social enterprise called Cloudy Society Technology. Based on the data connected from four areas, we incubate social enterprises and help them to grow as an impactful social enterprise. Now you are looking at the slide that shows 16 different categories of social enterprises in China, including accessible field, uh, uh, elderly security, housing improvement, culture, sports and art, and manufacturing and inclusive finance, etc. At the same time, we have tried to categorize, categorize the social enterprises based on their specific target groups. We have come up with 14 groups which are normally considered in the middle and bottom level of pyramid. They include disabled, ethnic minorities, unemployed, or parents losing their only child, uh, vulnerable children and poor people, etc. Et so here uh, is a diagram showing the number and distribution of certified social enterprises in China from 2015 to 2019. I've measured them based on the 16 categories that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, the top category in the diagram, which means having the biggest number of social enterprises in China, is accessible service. The next one is education and training and community economy. And then in the structure map shown on the right hand side, it gives you an idea on the percentage of different social enterprises in China. Next slide, uh, yeah, the focus on my presentation today is good at seeing the future, the development of social enterprises in China. First of all, uh, most of the social enterprises are based in community. During the pandemic, these enterprises demonstrated a greater value and impact in the community for preventing pandemic. They also adopt different uh, ways to help the residents. Some specific groups uh, receive special attention, such as residents have to stay at home during the pandemic. At this time, social enterprises provide a grocery delivery service for the, resident, for the residents like Korea. It will reduce the impact to the local residents. On the other hand, uh, during the pandemic, the team spirit and cohesion of social enterprises grow since they have a sense of commitment uh, to contributing uh, to the society. At the same time, some social enterprises have discovered new opportunities. For example, uh, during the, the pandemic, uh, more services or transaction cannot be done in person. So uh, in this case, many social enterprises realize the potential and opportunities of providing service online and the certified social enterprises received government and social attention. Social enterprises in Chengdu, Beijing and Guangzhou have received the uh, contracts from government to provide community service, which is uh, widely recognized uh, by the government and the community. However, social enterprises face also great 
uh, financial pressures because of the business, because most of the business stopped, it is hard for them to receive payment from service provided before the pandemic, and it's hard for them to explore new businesses. It gives a huge pressure on the cash flow, and social enterprises raise higher demand for governmental purchase services since the time frame for public procurement takes relatively a longer time it sets a high requirement on social enterprises in terms of financial status and cash flow besides some uh, social enterprises would like to get more orders uh, of credit services reserved for them government subsidies like tax exemption or or delay in paying taxes etc etc time a large number of social enterprises are initiated by youth in china it demonstrated a sense of responsibility of social enterprises uh, in the process they organized their online sharing uh, volunteer service oil groups and a variety of uh, anti-pandemic rescue services. It reflected their efficiency and organizational responsibility so that we can find that youth in China have become the backbone of our social enterprises. So next slide please. Uh, this is the summary of the reports I just mentioned. In the picture on the right hand side you can see the various services that our social enterprises implemented during the pandemic. They included publicity, online services, or even donation from our social enterprises, such as uh, free courses, psychological support, community checking services, and services for underprivileged groups, uh, etc., etc. Our social enterprises did not passively wait during the pandemic but actively sought room and opportunity for providing service to continuously help our clients. This is a huge action for our social enterprises during the pandemic. So next slide, please. As you can see, through this uh, pandemic, our social enterprises needs help in the future. In the upper left corner, firstly, I hope that government departments can increase their support or, or purchases from social enterprises. The social enterprises can obtain more orders, uh, special social security, deferred payment of housing provident funds, and special tax relief. This is what our social enterprises hope that the government can provide. Uh, at the same time, in the upper right corner, how do we deal with the shortage of cash flow? So, for example, existing shareholders of Chinese social enterprises continue to provide funds, including funding bank loans and reducing staff number and their salary, which is not ideal. I understand that uh, we don't have uh, the option. And some will, would invite new shareholders to alleviate the pressures on, uh, on the cash flow. At the same time, in the lower left corner, social enterprises also find out that the opportunities for social enterprises appear. Just now, I also mentioned that company has also obtained a new development uh, direction in the future through the consolidation of uh, corporate culture and the unity of employees. It is because their actions during the pandemic prevention period gained more attention, trust, and even more potential resources. Their difficulties are mainly reflected in the cash flow mentioned earlier. The expected number of orders will be reduced and the time for resumption of work cannot be determined at the moment. This is the difficulties, challenges, uh, opportunities and actions uh, taken by our Chinese social enterprises during the pandemic. So next slide please. So for us, what the social enterprise service platform and the community need to do is to help social enterprises expand their influence in the region and their internal influence. In addition to the regional influence, social enterprises also have their influence in their respective fields, which can drive more regional enterprises or enterprises in the industry to become social enterprises, and then participating more in the process of solving social problems uh, at the same time, I also hope that through my sharing this time, some actions of social enterprises in China 
will be shared with the international uh, actors. They can then share the actions of uh, our social enterprises in China and then to, pre to produce some green impact uh, for, for our society. So this is my sharing today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to the interpreter as well as to Mr. Zia Zuan. I think uh, he has really prepared a very interesting um, PowerPoint sharing, uh, also to share with us about how actually social enterprise has developed in China with also their very important uh, and contribution of uh, style of social innovation, especially how social enterprise in China have been active in the prevention of uh, and also fighting of pandemic um, COVID-19 in China and providing uh, quite a vari variety of uh, services to the communities, including caring for elderly people with psychological disease, to disabled children, community service, protection service, cleaning, security, migrant workers, female, lone elderly, and so on. I think um, it's really very encouraging to see that um, through this uh, crisis, social enterprise in China see a, a lot of opportunities for its development. Also working more closely with the governments, advocating for uh, better public policies to support them, but also attracting more young people to join uh, social enterprise as middle force to, to change. I think that um, as we have already announced, um, his PowerPoint, as well as the PowerPoint of other speakers, will be uh, distributed to all participants, all attendees, and it will be posted at our GSEF uh, website. So you would uh, go uh, back to his uh, presentation with more time. And if you have any questions that you would like to ask to Mr. Jia you can do so even after this webinar. So once again, Thanks a lot to Mr. Jia Zhuan and, and his interpreter because we know that we had uh, a lot of logistical problems with you and especially with China because they do not allow actually people to uh, open an, an account uh, in June. And also we had very little means of communications with you. So thanks a lot for your patience and, and for your uh, support. Let me now uh, ask our third speaker, who is Ms. Nonle Memela. She is the program manager um, of Etekini Municipality. She has been responsible for managing and driving entrepreneurial programs in the region of Etekini Municipality and managed the small, service, small business development sector by implementing the set business model strategies, focusing on access to industry skills, to finance through external stakeholders' engagement, and also access to markets and procurement opportunities, as well as to the in infrastructures. Ms. Memela, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Lawrence, and greetings to everyone around the globe. And I hope that everyone is taking care of themselves and keeping safe during this difficult time that we are all facing. Firstly, I will just like to take this opportunity to appreciate the initiators and coordinators of this webinar session and also express my appreciation for the opportunity granted to share the experiences and strategies in terms of moving forward during this time and beyond. Uh, Lawrence has already given an overview and introduction of who I am and what are my responsibilities. However, I'm just going to outline a little bit more in terms of the business models, in terms of the kind of interventions that we provide when we implement those business models. The business model, the first one is the access to industry skills. What is it that we actually do there to assist the social enterprises? What we firstly do is we conduct the needs analysis to whatever specific sector in terms of us knowing what is it that they will require in terms of running their social enterprise. Once that uh, needs analysis has been conducted, 
we then provide the capacity building. And that is done through various trainings, such as technical trainings and non-technical trainings. And also through that, we provide the access to finance through the external stakeholder engagements. And that is done to the financial development institutions. Because as a municipality, we, might, we may not be Mamela, are you there? Provide direct in terms of assisting. Yes, I am. Hello. Yeah, okay, we hear you. Great. Hey, Go can ahead. You hear me now? Oh, have you been hearing me? Oh, okay. Yes, we all hear right. you. Okay, all right. Thank you. So, just to get back again, um, for the stakeholder external uh, engagements, we provide an advisory role to the social enterprises in terms of assisting them in terms of developing their bankable business plans should there be a need that they need to supply i mean to go and seek funding in the financial development institutions and then what we do as well with the finance with the external stakeholders we seek any possible capacity building programs that we can leverage on and partner so that we are able to do any capacity building in a unified format and not working in silos, but working in partnerships. Also, we do the access to markets and procurement opportunities. But firstly, we would capacitate all the social enterprises, depending on the kind of product or commodities or service that they are co currently providing, to make sure that whatever product is of the good quality, that when it gets to the market, it is received very well and that it meets the required standards and regulations. Also, we identify the gap in the market so that we assist them to penetrate that particular market. But most of all, we would make sure that we first provide the opportunities within the municipality where we promote the buy local, invest local for whatever uh, commodities that are required within the municipality, we will then procure from the social enterprises providing them with that kind of experience so that should other external stakeholders feel the need to procure from them, we have already provided that sort of experience to them as well. And they can also work around any challenges or build up to the good products. And then the access to infrastructure. Within the municipality, we provide incubators. We have virtual incubators where social enterprises would come and meet for engagement sessions and networking sessions to, in order for them to share ideas. And also we have some rental spaces that is mostly for the informal traders. We provide a minimal rental amount so that uh, they are able to proceed with their everyday operations in that particular sector. Uh, next slide, please. Now moving into the challenges. Uh, currently, as you know, we are three months into the lockdown with the, in South Africa. And currently we have 327,000 people that have lost their job or employment just during these three months alone. And we anticipate that employment will rise by another 42%. In Durban alone, 34% of economy has returned in stage four. Uh, I would later explain to you what I mean in the stages, but however, I will, it will take 18 months to get back to the pre-lockdown levels. What do we mean by the stages? Our government had introduced the lockdown levels in order for them to guide us as citizens of the country as to what type of regulations can be implemented or what type of regulations can be relaxed within that particular stage or level. Okay, in level five, which was the complete shutdown or complete lockdown, where there was no movement permitted to, and it was only movement that was permitted to essential services only. And then there was level four. In level four, it was mostly the relaxation of some regulations, whereby there was open trade for services sectors, such as agriculture, informal traders, but the informal traders were limited 
to a minimal type of commodities to be sold. And then there's level three of which it is the level that we are at now. The economy is more relaxed with more people going back to work, but still require to adhere to the set standard operating procedures and regulations of the COVID-19 regulations. And then there will be level two and level one. However, level two and level one will be guided by the status or will be determined by the status of the COVID-19 pandemic, of which then it will drive us to say, are we then as a country readily to move to level one or level two? And then the next slide, please. More of the challenges. These challenges were challenges that were identified from enterprises. So there were common challenges that the enterprises have been facing during these three months of the, of the lockdown. One of the challenges was keeping up with the legislations. The business landscape is changing at a rapid pace. Government releases new regulations that affect social enterprises almost every day. Uh, dealing with information overload that has seemed to be quite a huge challenge because there's so much information that coming that's coming in in different angles and it has become so much that people don't have the time to actually interpret the information to suit their current operations and be able to make informed decisions to move on with their operations then there's a lot of fear anxiety hopelessness and high levels of stress there's been a reduction in movement, which is pertaining to the curfew. That means limited time to daily uh, routines. Therefore, it meant businesses had to close very early and opening maybe early and closing very early as well, which means there's less time for them to operate, which then has led to a lot of financial loss. There has been no participation in community development initiatives. Many social enterprises in the rural areas depend on de community development programs to capacitate themselves and also to network amongst each other. With these not being available, it has become quite a difficult time for the social enterprises. There's been limited access to community-based facilities such as uh, no internet access facilities, because you know, at this time, government is providing a lot of assistance, but those require that you access the internet. But with those facilities not being available, it has become a huge challenge. Having to dispose their perishable goods due to not being able to trade. As the lockdown was introduced, a lot of the social enterprises, for instance, that are operating within the agricultural space, they still had a lot of commodities or goods within themselves that they still needed to get to the market. But because it was the time of the lockdown, they were left with quite a surplus of the goods in, in, in their hands. So that has gone into waste as well. Uh, job losses, which is dismissing employees due to the financial loss. And also the other last challenge will be selecting the right focus which therefore meant it was difficult to know where to prioritize time and resources. Can you move on to the next slide, please? The initiatives that have been taken. Uh, what we have done as a country that we have leveraged on existing data and also lessons learned from other countries. This is done to pave the way forward in crafting strategies, taking into account lessons learned from the other countries. And then there's also been government support programs, such as the financial relief scheme to assist enterprises that are in financial distress during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there's also been tax relief schemes, unemployment insurance funds, uh, debt relief schemes, informal traders financial assistance, and business growth financial schemes. And there's also been grants for the unemployed in order for them to buy those basic commodities for everyday life. There's also been a view that we needed to accelerate the forming of solid partnerships with various stakeholders. We needed to integrate the learning platforms instead of working in silos. 
And also we needed to focus to virtual trainings and remote trainings because you know, due to the COVID-19 regulations, we cannot be in many groups. This has been a challenge, a, a huge challenge for the social enterprises. As you know, there's no access to internet. So we have to keep on finding other ways that we're going to assist the social enterprises to get and receive the information that is highly required. So what we we'll do in this regard is that we would partner with radio stations to disseminate information and also any other form of direct messaging or communicating uh, with this. And then we have an online one-stop shop for taking any inquiries or to distribute information. And the overall strategy that we have as the city is that we have developed the economy recovery plan in terms of moving forward. And that document is, is, is a living document, which is updated uh, with progress, progress weekly. There are six pillars to that to that recovery plan. Slide, next slide. And one I'm just going to outline a few uh, due to time. That is supporting to rural and informal economy, whereby we, in, we promote the buy local and invest local in, in terms of their, in their procurement spent. And then also to monitoring the city's income and health of the economy. And also the operationalization, the economic trust fund, which the mayor is going to champion within the city. And also we're going to kickstart uh, many sectors such as construction, which have been put on hold uh, during the lockdown. And for further information, I would like you to further go into the, 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 the Global Social Entrepreneurship um, Forum website where more of my slides will be uploaded for further information. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Ms. Mamela, I think um, very interesting um, experience shared by um, Atakini municipality. As we all know that um, the impact of this pandemic crisis has been most um, strong in um, African countries, in, in many developing countries, although the South Africa is not one of those developing countries. But nevertheless, I think that there is a proportion of informal economy is very high. And also that this pandemic has been so strong and so much impacted uh, the whole society as well as the economy of South Africa. So it's amazing actually to see that they anticipate the unemployment rate to rise by 42% and such a big uh, loss of um, Durban's economy, and they would take more than uh, one year and six months actually to get back to pre-lockdown levels. But even with that, uh, so much of loss of businesses. But at the same time, I think um, it's very interesting actually that uh, the, the challenges uh, she has highlighted, uh, both in terms of overloaded information to reach that um, many social economy, social solidarity economic organizations, enterprise are having difficult to deal with, including fear, anxiety, and hopelessness, high level of stress. I think some of other um, local government who share their experience, actually they are also providing psychological counseling, mentoring uh, services to those um, social and social economic entrepreneurs who have very um, great difficulty of uh, anxiety and, and level of stress. It's, I think it will be interesting also to exchange of those um, experience. I think that uh, overall strategy, I, uh, I think what she sh has shared in terms of six pillars of the economic recovery plan, hopefully that uh, this would help to rebuild a more strong uh, ecosystem of social solidarity economic um, enterprise and, and organizations in Etikini municipality. Uh, as she said, I think you can um, actually get the full uh, slide of her presentation at our website, but also you can raise questions to um, in the chat of Q&A uh, to her uh, if you have some uh, questions that you would like to put uh, to Ms. Mamela. Thank you very much once again, Ms. Mamela. 
I think since we are a little bit running out of the time, but I would like to call our next speaker, Mr. Jo Ju Hyun. He is the CEO of Seoul Social Economy Center in South Korea. He has been working as the former CEO of TIPAT, uh, one of the leading social enterprises in Korea. And he has joined uh, Seoul Social Economy Center from the uh, very first uh, of this uh, January this year. Uh, he has been working um, as a quite a prominent promoter of civic initiative and cultural project for local regeneration and community building. But he has been also working as the head director of the Ministry of Public Administration and Safety Prosperity for all projects in 2019 last year. He had also worked as a head coordinator for Korea Failure Exposition 2018 as well as chief planner of the master plan for the new Gyeonggi province building in 2015 and, and so on. Um, I would like to invite now Mr. Jo to share about how pandemic has created new opportunities for Seoul's social economy ecosystem. Mr. Jo, floor is yours. We are having a, a simultaneous translation between Korean and English. So those who cannot understand Korean, please, you can go to the globe and click uh, English. Mr. Joe? Joe John Center, Jangnim? Okay. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. 네, 네. 사무국장님이 설명해 주셨듯이 저는 서울시의 사회적 경제 정책을 만들고 또 이걸 실제적으로 사회적 경제 기업들을 지원하는 일들을 이제 하고 있습니다. 지금 어, 뭐 서, 대한민국 또 서울도 마찬가지로 큰 어, 코로나 위기를 겪고 있는데 나름대로 방역을 잘 하고 있는 상황인데 이런 상황 속에서 코로나가 큰 위기를 겪고 있지만 어쩌면 서울의 사회적 경제는 좋은 기회로 삼아서 새로운 정책을 만들고 집행하는 계기로 삼으려고 노력을 하고 있습니다. 그런 내용에 관해서 서울시의 어떤 정책들을 어떤 방향으로 펼치고 있는지 그런 설명을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 네, 다음 페이지 넘겨주시죠. 뭐 많이 아시는 분들도 계시겠지만 한국의 코로나 방역이라고 하는 것이 굉장히 좋은 이제 방역 체계와 시민들의 수준 높은 의식 때문에 굉장히 잘 대응을 하고 있다라고 하는 것에 대해서 그게 왜 한국 사회가 이런 거에 굉장히 잘 대응하고 있느냐라고 하는 이유에 관해서 세계적으로 다양한 논의들이 진행되고 있다고 저희가 듣고 있습니다. 많은 국가에서는 이게 민주주의 사회에서 굉장히 개방적인 어떤 개방적이고 투명한 정책 시스템 또는 높은 시민 의식 때문에 그렇게 되고 있다라는 얘기도 있고 또 한편에서는 그이 아시아권, 그러니까 이 동아시아권에서 어 가지고 있는 전통적인 뭐 집단주의 또는 유교 문화 이런 것들 때문에 어 정부의 어떤 정책들을 어 시민들이 어잘 수용하는 어떤 시민 의식 때문에 그렇다라고 하는 다양한 국제 사회의 시선들이 이제 존재합니다. 어 그래서 그 시선들에 관해서 어, 바로 전달에 어, 한국의 주요한 언론에서 그게 어떤 원인일까라고 하는 것들에 관해서 중요한 설문조사를 한 내용이 있습니다. 그 내용을 잠깐 보시면 어, 이게 두 가지 큰 성향이 다른 사람들을 비교하고 있는 건데요. 그러니까 권위주의가 강하고 또 수능지향적이고 
집단주의적인 성향을 가지고 있는 시민들과 또 그에 좀 상반된 민주적 시민의식을 가지고 있고 또 특히 젊은 세대들이 수평적인 개인주의가 강한 성향들의 사람을 비교하면서 방역 참여의 점수가 어떻게 차이가 나는지를 지난 5월 달에 주요한 언론에서 설문조사, 설문조사를 진행했습니다. 그런데 굉장히 놀랍게도 권위주의나 수능지향적이고 집단주의적인 분들의 성향을 갖고 있는 분들은 방역 참여한 점수가 별 차이가 안 납니다. 거의 뭐 일정 정도 차이가 안 나는데 민주적이고 시민적이고 수평적이고 개인주의적인 성향을 갖고 있는 분들은 굉장히 차이가 납니다. 그런 의식이 차이가 있어서 어쩌면 방역 참여에 굉장히 적극적인 시민들은 민주적인 시민의식과 굉장히 수평적이고 개인주의적인 성향을 갖고 있는 사람들이 방역 참여의 주역이었다라고 하는 내용들이 이 설문조사에서 볼수 있습니다. 또 어, 다음 넘겨주시면 어, 그 설문조사의 또 중요한 시사점이 하나 어, 보여지는 게 있는 건데요. 어, 이 위기 국면 속에서 그 여태까지 대한민국 사회가 그렇게 신뢰 수준이 굉장히 높은 사회가 아니었는데 어, 코로나 이전과 지금 코로나 어, 이후에 어, 대한민국 사회에서 신뢰조 수준이 높아진 건 무엇이고 신뢰가 더 떨어진 것은 무엇인지 라고 하는 질문을 했습니다. 대부분, 대부분의 경우가 한국 사회 대부분의 영역에서 신뢰가 굉장히 높아졌다. 이게 왼쪽 부분이거든요. 까만색으로 있는 왼쪽 부분이 특히 뭐 질병관리본부나 의료기관 또는 대한민국 정부 어, 이런 부분에서는 굉장히 신뢰가 높아졌다 라고 하고 있고 반대로 오른쪽 회색 부분에 있는 뭐 종교기관이나 언론 또는 국회 같은 데들이 신뢰가 낮아졌다 라고 하는 중요한 시사점이 있는데 그 중에서 이 오렌지색 되어 있는 부분이 어, 굉장히 중요한 포인트입니다 그러니까 전반적으로 대한민국 사회가 신뢰 수준이 높아졌는데 그 중에 이36 점에 해당하는 낯선 사람에 대한 신뢰는 더, 더 떨어졌다. 그러니까 대부분 신뢰 관계는 높아졌는데, 그, 그러니까 이 알고 있는 그 사람들, 뭐 친척, 가족은 신뢰 관계가 높아졌지만, 어쩌면 가까이 있는지 모르겠지만 잘 모르는 낯선 사람들에 관해서는 더 신뢰 관계가 낮아졌다라고 하는 어, 설문이 있습니다. 이것은 특히 대한민국 사회가 OECD 그 사회자본 하위 5위거든요. 거의 최하위 저신뢰 사회인데 전반적으로 신뢰관계가 높아졌는데도 불구하고 어이 그러니까 사회적 신뢰를 구성하는 굉장히 중요한 요인인 타인에 대한 신뢰 수준은 오히려 후퇴하고 있다라고 하는 굉장히 시사점이 있는 이 조사가 나온 겁니다. 그래서 어, 다음 페이지 보여주시면 어, 저희가 그이 사회적 경제 정책을 펼칠 때 지금 이 코로나 상황 속에서 어, 굉장한 큰 시사점은 뭐냐면 어, 민주시민으로서의 자신감 회복을 했다라고 하는 것은 굉장히 기회지만 타인에 대한 불신이 더 많아졌다라고 하는 것은 큰 위기 상황에 놓여져 있다. 있다. 그래서 어, 새로운 이게 코로나 상황 이후에 어, 사회적 경제 정책을 만들 때이 민주적인 시민들을 사회적 경제로 끌어들이는 것또 신뢰 수준을 높이기 위해서 사회적 경제 활동을 더 많이 부각시켜서 사회적 자본을 확충시켜야 한다는 것또 이것은 굉장히 작은 단위의 지역 그러니까 로컬 단위에서 어, 이런 어, 사회적 경제 활동을 굉장히 높여서 이 사회적 경제 저변을 굉장히 확대하는 규모화 전략을 통해서 이 자신감과 불신의 위기를 극복할 수 있는 정책 방향이 만들어져야겠다라고 하는 생각을 하게 됐다는 겁니다. 
어, 다음 페이지 보시면 어, 지금 어, 대한민국 서울에서 한 10년 동안 사회적 경제 정책을 어, 실현함으로 해서 지금 현황을 잠깐 이제 보여드리려고 하고 있는 건데 맨 왼쪽에 있는 어, 서울의 사회적 경제 기업 수가 어, 작년 말 기준으로 4,834개 정도가 되어 있고 또뭐 여러 가지 공공부매 매출 시장 자체가 어, 1,300억 정도 된다고 하고 있습니다. 어, 이 규모와 사회적 기업들이 제가 이제 여기 기관에서 3월 달 정도에 코로나 상황에서 어, 작년 동기 대비 매출 감소나 뭐 이런 것들이 얼마나 일어났냐라고 이제 조사를 해봤더니 어, 50% 이상 매출이 감소한 어, 기업들이 72%가 되고 이 기업들의 분야들이 뭐 문화예술 분야, 뭐 공연 행사 전시 분야, 뭐 여행업, 교육 서비스 이런 부분이 대다수였고 또 이런 기업들이 지금 현재 원하는 어떤 정책 지원들이 빠르게 금융 지원을 좀 해달라 또 판로를 좀 지원해달라 이런 부분들이 있었습니다. 이런 부분들을 가지고 저희가 이 코로나 상황에서 어떤 부분의 정책들을 지금 만들어 나가야 되고 이후에 코로나 이후 상황에서도 그걸 대처할 수 있는 새로운 정책으로 만들어야, 해, 만들어야 될까 이런 부분을 고민했는데요. 그게 그 다음 페이지에 볼수 있습니다. 어, 그러니까 아까 우리가 이 코로나 위기 때문에 시민의식을 가진 많은 그 시민들이 어, 한국 사회에서 어, 연대하면 우리가 큰 위기를 극복할 수 있다고 라 하는 그런 그 자긍심을 가진 시민들이 굉장히 많이 늘어났다는 겁니다. 그래서 그 민주적인 시민들이 어, 지역 단위에서 서로 신뢰할 수 있는 지역 사리를 만들어내고 이걸 지속할 수 있도록 정책적으로 촉진하는 이것을 본격적으로 이 코로나 이후 상황에서는 사회적 경제에 굉장히 중요한 정책으로 만들어 나가는 것이 굉장히 중요한 핵심적인 정책이 되겠다. 지금까지는 어, 대한민국 서울에서 대부분 사회적 경제 지원 정책이라고 하는 것은 이런 각성한 민주 시민들을 지원하기보다는 사회적 경제 기업들을 지원하는 것이 대부분이었습니다. 그런데 어, 이런 코로나 상황을 같이 겪었던 많은 시민들을 사회적 경제 주체로 끌어들이고 같이 협력할 수 있는 시민 경제로 나아가는 것이 굉장히 앞으로의 정책에서 중요하겠다, 중요하겠다 이렇게 생각하게 된 예, 계기가 된 겁니다. 그래서 다음 페이지 보시면 어, 세 가지 차원에서 어, 다음 페이지 보여주시죠. 세 가지 차원에서 이 시민경제 정책을 펼쳐나가는 것이 중요하겠다라고 이제 생각을 어, 하고 있습니다. 그러니까 사회적 경제의 기업의 수를 늘리는 것이 아니라 또는 기업의 규모를 늘리는 것이 아니라 아까 함께한 시민들의 활동의 양을 규모화하는 게 굉장히 중요하겠다. 아, 기업수나 매출의 규모가 아니라 어, 시민들의 활동의 양을 사회적 경제 방식으로 활동의 양을 굉장히 규모화했을 때 했을 때 어, 이런 위기 상황에서 회복 능력이 굉장히 커지겠다. 그래서 어, 그렇게 활동하는 개인들 또 이분들이 지역에서 어떤 문제를 해결하는 어, 임팩트 또는 이분들이 지속화시킬 수 있는 어떤 미래의 가능성 이런 것들을 두고 이런 여러 가지 정책들을 지금 계획을 하고 있는 겁니다. 그 고계획 정책들 중에서 몇 가지만 설명을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 다음 페이지 넘겨주시면 네. 예, 지금 저희가 현재 하고 있는 소셜 솔루션 스쿨이라고요. 
지금 코로나 위기로 겪고 있는 다양한 분야의 사회적 경제 주체들이 있습니다. 뭐 교육 분야, 문화예술 분야, 먹거리 분야, 뭐 비영리 분야 또는 초기 사회적 기업들, 뭐 돌봄 분야 이런 분들하고 만나기 어려우니까 온라인으로 그 작은 분야별로 다양한 온라인 간담회를 지금 막 뿌리고 있습니다. 그래서 어 쉽게 해결할 수 있는 것들은 어 거기에 자체적으로 해결할 수 있는 조언을 줄수 있는 멘토들 또는 고고의 이해 당사자들 또는 이제 공공영의 분들이 들어와서 즉시 해결할 수 있는 방안도 찾고요. 찾고요. 중장기적으로 해결해야 될 부분들은 이 온라인 간담회의 결과를 어, 새로운 사회적 경제 20.0 액션 플랜으로 만들어서 어, 앞으로의 사회적 경제 5개년 계획을 이런 사회적 경제 주체들이 만들어나는 계획을 소셜 솔루션 스쿨을 통해서 만들어 나가는 일을 지금 진행을 하고 있습니다. 그리고 그 다음 페이지도 보여주시면 이런 일들이 지역사회 내에서는 돌봄이나 주민기술학교나 또는 아파트 안에서의 여러 가지 시민들의 활동이 사회적 경제 활동으로 연결되는 것들을 묶어서 하나의 생활 속 사회적 경제를 실현하는 방식으로 시민들이 사회적 경제가 주체가 되는 어, 일들로 지역 생활 관리 혁신 사업들을 사회적 경제 사업으로 진행을 지금 시키고 있습니다. 또그 다음 페이지 또 보여주시면 어, 그런 일들이 지금 아주 작은 단위의 골목 상권들이 코로나 사태로 문을 닫거나 아니면 폐업 위기에 지금 있습니다. 그런 골목 단위의 소상공인들을 몇몇이 협동해서 사회적 경제 주체로 전환하는 사업을 지원하는 겁니다. 여태까지는 이런 사업을 해오지 않았는데 이번에 이 사업을 신규 정책으로 만들어서 지금 하반기부터 추경의 예산을 편성해서 이 사업을 실질적으로 진행하고 있습니다. 이건 어, 지역의 여러 가지 소상공인 주체들을 하나의 사회적 경제 주체로 전환하는 사업들을 진행하고 있는 겁니다. 마지막 페이지 넘겨주시면 어, 그리고 마지막으로는 이런 사업들을 같이 할수 있는 주체가 기존의 우리 사회적 경제 기업들이거든요. 이 사회적 경제 기업들의 고용을 새롭게 확대한다든지 또는 고용을 유지하는 것에 있어서 어, 서울시에서 여러 가지 정책 자금을 통해서 고용을 유지하고 창출할 수 있는 것들을 사회적 경제 뉴딜 사업으로 지원해주고 있습니다. 이 사업을 통해서 사회적 경제 기업과 새로운 시민들이 만나서 이 코로나 위기를 신속하고 또 협동하는 방식으로 해결해 나갈 수 있도록 서울시와 저희 사회적 경제 지원센터가 도움을 드리고 있는 상황입니다. 네, 이상입니다. 감사합니다. Thank you very much, Mr. j o e I think it's a very interesting presentation of um... Thank you. I think it was a very interesting um, presentation um, of actually how uh, COVID-19 has uh, impacted um, the situation and the survival of many uh, social, solidarity, economic enterprise and organizations, especially in particular sectors such as culture, art, convention, exhibition, tourism, education sectors, as well as some um, um, uh, sectors of restaurants, social welfare, etc. But at, at the same time, Seoul Social Economy uh, Center is trying to uh, build its momentum of uh, very good uh, democratic uh, citizens who have contributed to overcome this crisis as, as an asset to make a transformation from social solidarity economy centered. Uh, policies to the sustainable civic economy. It's a very interesting concept that he has actually has shared. How actually this crisis could be an opportunity for social solidarity economy to scale up as uh, more as a civic economy uh, rooted in enabled democratic citizens to manage their daily living at the local level and and build trust. Trust worships and expand those effects into a more sustainable civic um, economy. I think that um, 
this presentation has been quite uh, uh, substantive and, 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 and engage quite interesting strategies and policies that uh, we could uh, discuss and extend more in terms of uh, exchange of practices and, and policies. But I, I would leave this time for the questions and, and also further uh, engagement with um, other speakers as well as other attendees. Since we have little time left, I would like to invite our last speaker, Mr. Anthony Wong. Thank you very much once again to Mr. Joe, but let me invite our last speaker, Mr. Anthony Wong. He is the business director from the Hong Kong Council of so Social Service. Hong Kong in, in China. And Mr. Anthony Wong has been a very uh, historic and close friend of GSEF uh, since its foundation. And he has been working uh, at the Hong Kong Council of Social Service for over 20 years. Now he's responsible for social service development and policy research and advocacy on various police areas, including housing, poverty, family and community service, children and youth service and so on. I guess seeing that all those areas and police areas that he's in charge, he must be very busy with this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And currently he's in charge of two social housing projects initiated by Hong Kong Council of Social Service, namely community housing movement and modular social housing. Mr. Wong, you have Hi. the floor. Yes, Lawrence, uh, do I, uh, so uh, you are you. I'm going to use this slides, right? Or 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 I should share my slides. Sorry. You hear me? We are sorry. We are we are going to show to, the slides. You know, to to show the slides, you can just go okay. ahead. Okay. Now, uh, I think. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I think uh, a lot of uh, issues particular uh, the issues that uh, we're facing uh, in different society. I think a lot of uh, speakers have already uh, commented and pointed out some of the observations that you have seen, uh, like uh, problem uh, in terms of uh, 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 employment, particularly, of course, health issues and social isolation. But I would like to add an up, uh, a backdrop before I start my presentation because preceding the uh, COVID-19, uh, we had a half, more than half year of uh, sort of social and political movement in Hong Kong, uh, triggered by the uh, amendment of the extradition law. And that had already uh, created a very big social division uh, within the society. But the emergence of uh, COVID-19 after the Chinese New Year uh, we witness another round of not just social division, but also social isolation because of the social distancing uh, policy. And a lot of people in Hong Kong, we actually were quite uh, isolated. Particularly, we had a we done a, we did a survey in April. A lot of uh, patients or elderly people who are actually uh, having no access to uh, the kind of social service and healthcare services that they used to have. And so they are sort of, uh, you know, quite uh, stuck in their own uh, household and particularly in the kind of a city like Hong Kong. Uh, although we are very densely populated, but uh, in fact, people may not, you know, see each other very often if you have this kind of COVID-19. But instead of talking about too much about these social problems, I would like to talk more about the sector itself, that is social economy, uh, social solidarity economy, in terms of uh, the, um, the problem that we face as an NGOs or as also as enter social enterprises. Uh, the f um, I would like to follow the uh, questions that raised by uh, GSEF. Uh, uh, the first thing, I th uh, a lot of people talk about money. Uh, like uh, NGO sector and also social enterprise sector. For, for about a decade or two in Hong Kong, we've been talking about like we should, you know, create social enterprises, not to rely on the government funding. Uh, we should rely on the social market. That is a people 
that could generate income from, you know, really uh, from the bottom up. But uh, this COVID-19 thing uh, had uh, eliminated a problem, like even for NGOs, like uh, they do not uh, receive subvention or funding from the government. They have to rely on like community events, corporate partnership events, or even uh, street level uh, donation, monthly donation, this kind of thing under the a kind of a social isolation. It was no longer possible. So a lot of uh, non subvented NGO, what we call in Hong Kong, they were actually, uh, I think, maybe half year of income has been write off, written off. You see, that create a very big problem. As early as in March, a lot of uh, non subvented NGO had already uh, come across even cash flow problem already. If, uh, for example, if you are a social enterprise, of course, because you rely on market, so the market cannot could not be function. So, in different in in any in any way, so uh, they cannot uh, the kind of income that uh, helping them to uh, sustain the organization could, were no longer available. And for a lot uh, more than a decade. Uh, a lot of social enterprise relying on creating jobs for the uh, 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 socially disadvantaged, like people with disabilities. Uh, just all of a sudden, all these jobs, because of the income was lost, and all these jobs, of course, were lost. And I find that in the uh, middle of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I find that uh, a lot of, uh, in Hong Kong, as uh, Mr. Cho said uh, in his presentation, very, uh, inspirational inspiration that uh, in a society like Hong Kong we are more towards although we have a lot of problem political problem now but we are more towards like a liberal regime okay but uh, so every uh, the organization or individuals even without the function of the government they will be able to perform some kind of function at the civil society level in a very decentered way Although they are able to respond to, to different needs, uh, but they may not know each other. And, and I find that at different level, at a global sort of a city municipal level, or even at the community level, there was a really rare kind of effort to put together different organization. I would term it like this is like a, uh, like a structurally isolated. They do not work together themselves usually. They just work towards their own cause or they just work to help people at the community uh, for a single particular cause. But at this time, maybe uh, as uh, Lin mentioned, that we should work independently, but also collaboratively, right? So uh, that kind of collaboration, I think at the community level or even at the city level, you have to have somebody to facilitate this kind of collaboration. And I would say that without the government, particularly in Hong Kong, because the government is no longer trusted as a centrally organized uh, entity. So uh, we, there is a bit of demand on uh, this kind of what I call intermediary kind of platform to put together different organization or different, different stakeholders so that um, they could work together collaboratively. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposals that we have, of course, a lot of people, even the, uh, the household level, organizational level, a lot of organizations are having uh, a lot of uh, problem. Uh, so immediate cash assistance to meet the cash flow problem of the SSC is most uh, urgently needed. But um, unfortunately, it's not very successful. We, uh, we, do, we were able to raise fund, fund to support this kind of uh, organization uh ngos or social enterprises but uh um we do, we don't have uh a lot of resources still is uh, still being owned and uh by the central government by the government itself so uh when if when when you need this kind of resources you find that in the community even though there may be a lot of uh, money but you do not have an effective mechanism to put pull all these money together and then help the people or help the organization in needs. And as I said, uh, 
we actually uh, proposed to the government to help this organization to meet the cash flow problem. And, and also, uh, we also propose that like at the central level, we have our council uh, actually help some help a bit in putting together different effort in the, organ in the community to try to alleviate different kind of problem. But at the community level, I think we still, uh, in Hong Kong, it's very interesting during the uh, pandemic, uh, a lot of organizations at the community level were very eager to help people in the neighborhood level. But it just so happened that they are just single effort and nobody puts them together. So I think, again, this kind of platform will be needed. And, and uh, I would like to share one experience that uh, during the pandemic, we were able to uh, source some uh, face masks because in Hong Kong, we uh, genuinely believe in face masks not uh, different from other country. So uh, we source face masks from the market and also try to distribute to uh, particularly to people who are vulnerable. But, um, but uh, it, I had an observation that uh, this kind of thing, like if, you, if those kind of goods or services are market-based, you better let the civil society do it. Otherwise, the market will respond to the demand very, uh, uh, in, a, in a very um, disruptive way. That is, if a government, like uh, early on, uh, the uh, hospital authority was saying that they, that they did not have enough face masks. And I was very worried about uh, what kind of price that they will be charged by uh, this supplier. So it will be very, it will be better, I think, it will be better for civil society to do it because you have a charity kind of charity motive and then when you appeal for this kind of resources in terms of service or goods, that could, you know, you can get a better deal. But if it is a government, then the same face mask may cost, you know, two times or three times higher for the price. But I think the government still has its own role to play, like uh, in terms of regulation, in terms of how you regulate people should, you know, maintain social distance or different, different kinds of things. Still, they have a role to play. But the rule-based affairs, I think that's the government role. Um, the other thing is, I think it's quite, um, I don't know how to uh, frame it, but uh, the business sector, some of them, of course, they would you know, try to you know, earn more money because of this kind of crisis. But some of them do uh, very much help, uh, want to help these people in the community. I think, uh, in fact, this is a good time for them to do some kind of a better PR, like the big developers in Hong Kong. Some people are actually um, appealing them to, uh, you know, donate more money to help people. But, you know, I don't know what they're doing. But in any case, whoever are doing all, any kind of this, this kind of help, flexible and fast is the top principle. And, and it's been a very long time that we rely on a big, you know, uh, institutional mechanism to distribute, redistribute and distribute resources. I think uh, if you still stick to that kind of mechanism, it's not going to help. So uh, we stress very much on flexibility and fast. So I, I do not have much time. Next slide, please. A co-creation. I think uh, now in Hong Kong, jobs, we lost a lot of jobs and relief and some far tr uh, track funding. And also uh, because a lot of uh, NGOs are actually uh, subvented, what we call subvented or subsidized by the government. And in fact, uh, we had a lot of uh, collaboration with the government in terms of uh, creating jobs, in, cre in terms of raising funds to uh, provide relief to the, to the household in need and also creating some fast track funding support to different organizations and different individuals. And also because of the subvention, uh, we have a management system and we work together with the government to, to decide uh, and to issue guidelines to the operators so that they, they know what to do and not not to do. And then last line, please. Uh, I think uh, very much uh, in Hong Kong, I see a whole new, um, whole new um, landscape here. I think it's very much, we are 
more and more deviated from, uh, no, I mean, staying away from the traditional kind of welfare state model, relying, everything relying on the government. A lot of people are actually uh, observe, observing, observe a lot of problems and needs, and they get informed, they identify all these needs, and some of them will be able to respond to this kind of problems and need by themselves. But even though for those needs and problems that which they could not be responded individually, they could voice out and channel to different kind of uh, social media or uh, you know, uh, working partners. And then it's somehow, it's like even in a very decentered way, we do not have a you know, centralized system, but somehow this kind of effort come together and then there are some you know, interesting collaboration uh, happening. I mean, if you just let the society and an economy to deal with this kind of problem, there is some surprising, you know, result and impact coming up from the uh, from the process. And and because of this, a lot of people just you know bring up their own idea. They may not be able to have resources to, you know, create this kind of service program or that kind of uh, material program. But as long as they can initiate, it's look. Uh, it, I had a feeling that there, are, there must be society, there must be so, uh, stakeholders in the society which may be able to chip in resources or bring people together and then, you know, deliver some kind of service. So we are actually in the process of the institutionalized, uh, the, in the original, very institutionalized culture and practice. The only thing that uh, I, I mentioned uh, previously that uh, still, a lot of resources are still very much centralized in the government. So um, uh, a lot of people and organizations still look to the government for uh, for solutions. And 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 I think in the in the years to come, uh, I remember one speaker said that uh, we should. Oh, I think Lin Lin said that uh, we should uh, bring back a better back, uh, bring bring a better uh, kind of uh, practice uh, back to the society. Uh, that's uh, all uh, for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Anthony Wong, um, for your presentation. Of course, I think that we do understand um, a very particular political context where you, the Hong Kong is uh, at the moment. Uh, as I think that, as you have shared at the very beginning, in terms of challenges that. Um, are faced by the Hong Kong, not only in terms of COVID-19, but also in the current political context, what it means, social isolation, and this uh, disconnection um, to uh, Hong Kong citizens, but also to uh, many social, social, economic enterprise and organizations. Thank you very much once again for your presentation. Uh, uh, I, I know that Sorry that I, I didn't switch down the video. Um, I would like to thank uh, in a very special way to all our speakers, actually five speakers from four different countries, but five different regions uh, who have shared very interesting uh, practices, challenges and strategies that they are uh, really trying to develop to better respond to the needs of social social economy organizations and enterprise as well as to the uh, growing need of citizens. I am very much conscious that we have consumed allocated time for this webinar, but it seems that there had been uh, uh, quite a great interest from attendees who have raised so many questions. So I would like to uh, ask if you would, um, for those who could stay with us for about 15 minutes, I would like to at least to give an opportunity to each speaker to respond uh, one or two questions that they have received. I would like to uh, give first to Ms. Lynn Collins who have received the two questions. Lynn, I think you have uh, received the two questions uh, from attendees. The one is, uh, do you think there is any room to call wider the shared economy or cooperative business model that can be incorporated in the mix for better secure future for the youth. And another question is, um, are there any working on business plan for youth below the age of 35 years? If yes, what are they? 
Okay, thank you, Lawrence. And to save yeah. time, I did just type a short response to each of the questions, but mm -hmm. to say that we envisage that young people will be involved in our recovery panel and also the Metro Mayor's Youth Advisory Group, which will sit alongside the recovery panel so that we make sure there is a direct voice for young people. We also have young people represented on our climate partnership, on our fairness commission and on our tackling poverty action group. So we've tried to integrate young people's voices throughout our, our structures to engage around how we recover. In, in terms of um, changing business models and how we can encourage them, we are going to be faced with a generation of young people who perhaps don't have open to them the normal opportunities for employment. So encouraging innovation and entrepreneurship with that cohort of young people will be important. So we're looking at developing specific innovation funds that they may be able to access. Um, but overall, um, our approach is that we don't have all the answers and we want to hear as many voices as possible, both from within our own city region, but nationally and internationally. So we're building a concept of a Liverpool city region living lab in the same way as there are many, many trials around the world to find a virus for COVID. We want to bring ideas together to find a solution for the viruses of poverty, of disadvantage, of unemployment that will result from this. So we're very, very open to idea sharing and today has been really helpful for me to hear of some of the ways in which other people around the world are responding to the same challenges we all have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, for, for your um, very clear response to the questions. Anyway, we will provide those questions and response also by email. Um, actually, that we have received more than five questions addressing to the uh, our speaker, Mr. Jia Zhuan from China. I think um, his presentation has um, created a lot of interest from various attendees. Uh, since because we are running up, out of time, uh, I would like to ask him to respond to two questions. Uh, the first one is um, very interesting information about Chinese social enterprise. Can it be explained how Chinese social enterprise are financed and how large are they in terms of numbers, employed income, please? And second question is that, is there a specific law in China that enables the registration, recognition, regulation and government support to social enterprise? Mr. Zia, are you ready to reply? Mr. Jia, Zuan? Mr. Jia, he's not. He's not. Uh, Mr. Mr. Jia, we don't uh, hear you. Okay, so then while he's preparing his response, I would like to give a flow to Mamela. You have received two questions also. Any change in government policies to cater to the needs of the people? What are they? Which sector should be more targeted? And then the second question is, what the oversupply of information mean for you? Mamela? Are you, are you there? Ms. Mamela? Uh, Mamela, we don't hear you. Please unmute. Yes, I have unmuted my mic. Can yeah. you, yeah, can now you hear me we now? Hear you. Very good. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's just that I was just drafting my, my responses. Yes, I did say yes. I think the government policies should be amended because obviously taking into account the current situation that we are all facing, it's, it's now what we call the new normal. So we can't expect everything to be as the same. There needs to be new regulations and operating standards that we need to adhere to. 
But when we amend those policies, we need to make sure that we review them, we monitor them and we evaluate them to see if they are serving a good purpose in that. So I think, yes, there should be an amendment in some of the government regulations. And then particularly, the next question was, is into what specific sectors should these amendments take place? Um, we can't single out some sectors because if I were to uh, say one particular sector, then what about the rest? Then won't that cause problems or challenges that may arise by neglecting some of the sectors? So I think that every sector should be looked into because most people operate in different sectors. We can no ignore one or two sectors. So I think, yes, all sectors are important and we should all find ways in terms of looking what particular sector should be looked into and what changes can be made to fit into the current situation and moving forward and adapting to the new normal. And the last question was, what do I mean by information overload? As I stated earlier on that, you know, we're in the beginning phases of the lockdown and there's been, what this is the experience that's coming from the social enterprises is that they've been receiving so much information from different sources. And then that has caused so much stir in their minds that they don't know which information to take and which information to disperse. So that's the kind of information overload that they, they, that they are experiencing. Not to say it's not important information. They are taking it in, but it's just too much, which then leads them to not being able to make uh, informed decisions within their operating spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Mamela. Um, thanks for your uh, well-prepared response. Now I would like to call Mr. Juhyun Jo, Jo Juhyun Santajangnim. You have two questions received from the attendees. The first question is, in Seoul, what are the main sectors of small businesses that are looking to be transformed into the social economic enterprises? The second question is that local governments are normally close to the people and can play an important role in local economic development. But very low percentage of people seem to trust them as shown by you. What, why this is so? Mr. Zhou, can you reply to, to these two questions? Mr. Zhou, Zhou Zhou and Senator Zhang? Yes, yes. 먼저 앞에 질문은 전환하길 바라는 이제 소규모 비즈니스 분야는 그 제가 아까 얘기 들었듯이 그러니까 시민들과 굉장히 밀접한 관련이 있는 생활권 단위의 여러 어그 서비스나 상품을 제공해 주는 어 가게들이 있습니다. 이런 부분들이 지역 내에서 좀 순환 경제를 만들어 내지 못하고 서비스의 질이나 뭐 가격 경쟁 면에서 낮다 보니까 자꾸 어뭐 프랜차이즈나 대기업 이런 서비스들이 그빈 부분을 자꾸 차지해 나가고 있거든요. 그런 부분들을 어몇개 그런 소상공인들이 결합해서 사회적 경제로 전환하면 경쟁력도 가질 수 있고 시민들한테 좀더 나은 서비스를 제공해 줄수 있다. 아 그런 건데요. 그런 부분들이 뭐 특히 어, 동네 골목 안에 있는 집술이라든지 조그만 동네 가게라든지 먹거리 분야에 있는 카페나 음식점 뭐 이런 거라고 어, 생각할 수 있습니다. 그런 부분들이 어, 사회적 경제로 전환하면 좋겠다. 그런 지원 사업을 그래서 하반기부터 하려고 하는 거고요. 그 다음에 두 번째 질문은 그게 이제 아까 어, 설문조사에서 나온 부분을 가지고 질문하신 것 같은데요. 그러니까 이번 그 한국에서 코로나를 겪으면서 어 지방 정부나 또 중앙 정부 그러니까 에, 정부가 다 엄청난 노력을 했어요. 어 그리고 또 평상시에는 특히 질문하신 것처럼 지방 정부가 여러 어, 시민들과 가깝고 어 지역 경제 발전에 중요한 역할을 하는 건 맞는데 요번 대한민국에서 코로나 방역에 에, 굉장히 적극적으로 대체하고 성공적인 어떤 어, 성과를 낸 것이 
중앙정부가 굉장히 많은 역할을 한 겁니다. 그래서 상대적으로 이런 조사를 했을 때 전체적으로 중앙정부에 대한 신뢰도가 높아졌다. 이런 것이지 상대적으로 지방정부가 그런 역할을 못했다. 이런 뜻은 아니라고 생각이 듭니다. 네, 이상입니다. 땡큐. 저 조준 선생님 끝나셨나요? 네, 네. 네, 끝났습니다. 미스터 주연조. 네, 네. And thanks for for your reply. Um, I think we have received also a few questions to Mr. Anthony Young. Anthony, I think um, one attendee is asking, uh, I would like to learn how social solid economy organizations in Hong Kong and South Africa are communicating with each other to discuss on their problems and find some solutions. So I think both Mamela and Anthony can uh, reply also to this question. And there is a question specifically to uh, Anthony. In your presentation, it has been mentioned that wise uh, suffer the most. Would it be possible to share with us which sectors and which vulnerable disadvantaged groups are affected the most and how okay. the government is supporting them? Okay, uh, um, maybe I first respond to the second question because okay. uh, a lot of uh, wise organizations actually, were actually set up uh, to support people like people with disabilities. And they created uh, quite a lot of jobs. A lot of uh, people with disabilities were working there for many, many years. But because of this pandemic and the uh, if impact, negative impact on the business, a lot of this kind of social enterprise are uh, you know, having a big problem of survival. And together, these jobs will be lost. And for this kind of uh, people with disability, it will be very difficult for them to find and other jobs equally, you know, uh, well job uh, in the com in the open market. So, I think this uh, kind of uh, impact on people with disabilities and also other kind of uh, disadvantaged groups uh, working in the social enterprise are hardly hard hit uh, during, uh, after the pandemic. For communication with the uh, NGOs and other. Uh, stakeholders uh, in the community to identify and uh, identify problems and find solutions. I think because uh, our council is actually a platform of NGOs and social enterprises. And uh, we receive, uh, during all these few months, we receive a lot of different information and observation at uh, a channel up from the bottom uh, from their uh, service uh, uh, centers and, and places. So we, uh, we have uh, maintained quite an effective communication platform with all these organizations. And of course, with the, uh, you know, quite, you know, advanced communication uh, and social media uh, platform in Hong Kong, uh, this kind of problems and solutions, uh, problems are widely shared. And solutions, if they are being identified from one organization or two organizations, they'll be quickly shared among uh, the community. So a, little, a lot of people are picking up ideas and maybe we knew it or we uh, created into a, a very different kind of solutions. And that could actually help to alleviate prob problems at the community level, particularly when uh, we have a very diverse society here, and the needs I actually have, we have to be able to differentiate the needs of different groups of people. And after the differentiation and with, the, with a kind of decentral, decentral kind of uh, structure, uh, that individual organizations, social enterprises or NGO would then be able to meet this kind of uh, diverse and differentiated needs. So I think uh, we do have a bit of platform to, uh, for, to facilitate this kind of communication. What I was trying to say in my presentation is that at some level, particularly at the locality or neighborhood level, uh, people are still 
looking around and see who is going to, you know, sort of champion a drive for a collaborative uh, effort to create a uh, bigger change for the community. Uh, but at the central level, I think our council, at least in, this, in the social welfare sector, we've been playing this role. But I, I think there must be a lot of room for improvement for other sectors as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Anthony. Um, would you like to also to mention something about how you would like to to build the communication between Hong Kong and South Africa? Uh, of course, like this platform here now, we are having a you know direct communication uh, with uh, with uh, guests from. Uh, from South Africa, so I think uh, from Africa, so uh, I think we are happy to uh, open up more channels to communicate. In fact, we've been also through other international platform. We have been we have also been uh, communicating with these stakeholders in other countries and in other parts of the world. So we are open to uh, different kind of uh, uh, possibilities. And, uh, and through this platform, we'll be able to share our initiative, which we think effective in Hong Kong context, but then it's up for people to, 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 to interpret and to, to learn from. Yeah. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Anthony. Mamela, do, do you want to say something on this? You are unmuted. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, I will be responding to the question of how are the social enterprise organizations uh, communicating and interacting with each other? As I'd indicated prior that, you know, we are still in the early stages of our, our lockdown and many interactions have been put to a standstill. As you know, we are not able to have any networking sessions or any particular trainings or conferences. But then we had to rely solely on the online networking platforms in order to communicate. So what we've done is that as the municipality, we've worked very closely with the sector representatives of the social enterprises of where that is where we disseminate and share information that needs to be escalated to the social enterprises. However, that has still been quite a huge challenge because like for example, there has been the debt relief fund uh, that's been available for social enterprises. That debt relief fund, one of the criteria is to support, is to provide supporting documents, such as your business plans, your bank statements, and you know your your ID copies and any other supporting document. That has been an extreme challenge, because they do not have the actual resources to to provide. Uh, those documents. So as much as we disseminate the information, but there's still a challenge of receiving what is required. So we need to then go an extra mile as the local economic uh, uh, practitioners to find ways to assist them where we've had to, as I've indicated in my presentation, we open up a one-stop shop whereby we collect all these inquiries and then we assist them one by one. We will call back and assist them on an individual basis because most of them don't even have the airtime to make calls directly to us. So at least if one of the social enterprise or any of them have the means to actually send a message, then we'll take it upon ourselves to reach out back to them and provide the assistance or advisory services that they require. However, the communication and interaction is still a challenge. However, now that we are in level three, we are going to work on strategies on how to move forward because I think we can limit ourselves to a certain number of people into meeting rooms or networking sessions. So as to try and bring back that normal working form of interactions. So as we open up the economy, it will well then open up ways of communicating and interacting. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mamela. Um, I, I, as I see that Mr. Jia Zhuan is connected with us, I would like to invite him to respond to two questions that he has um, 
I think he has accepted to reply. Mr. Zia, I think you you have received these two questions, and the, the first one is, uh, can it be explained how Chinese social enterprise are financed and how large are they in terms of numbers, employed and incomes? And second question is, is there a specific law in China that enables the registration, ah. recognition, regulation and government support to social enterprise? Mr. Jia, floor is yours. Mr. Jia? Just one? Mm -hmm. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
So just just one. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mr. Jiajun, I think that um, really we are a little bit behind of time uh, and you have very extensive information uh, on these important questions and in also including you have some more questions to reply. We, we will forward those information to you by email and uh, also to other speakers. 
could you um, reply uh, more extensively uh, by email so we could share with all attendees? We would like to. Yeah, we would like to just summarize now uh, our webinar because we are uh, re really 45 minutes behind of, of the time. I think uh, it seems that uh, the mayor of Nakawa division of uh, Kampala is still connected, waiting for his um, question to be replied. Uh, uh, Mr. Joe, I think um, Mayor Ron Ronald Valimejo asked question that what lessons can social solidarity economy organizations in developing world pick from role of technology in improving effectiveness and performance? Would you like to reply? And this is going to be the last uh, question that we are going to reply. Jojen Santojangni? Jojen Santojangni? Uganda Shijangni Murupto on. Yeah. 어, 사회적 경제들이 테크놀로지의 효과성 등 증진을 위해서 어떤 부분을 좀 배울 수 있는지 이런 어, 질문이신 것 같은데요. Yes, that's the question. Yes, that's... 네, 네, 그게 이제 다른 나라의 개도국들이 뭐 그런 얘기를 하시는 거잖아요. 물론 사그뭐 지금 한국의 서울에서도 어, 그런 부분이 명확히 있는 건 아닙니다. 예, 특히 요번에 우리가 코로나를 겪으면서 그 대면 서비스를 많이 했던 교육이나 공연, 여행 이런 부분들이 어, 갑작스럽게 이제 비대면 서비스를 해야 되는 어, 요구 때문에 어, 저희한테 다양한 비대면 서비스로 전환하는 것에 대한 어, 지원 뭐 이런 것들을 이제 요구하고 있습니다. 그래서 어, 저희가 지금 계획하고 생각하고 있는 부분들이 어, 그런 사회적 경제 서울의 사회적 경제 조직들 중에서도 특히나 청년 스타트업 소셜 벤처 이런 데들은 사회적 경제 주체인데 여러 가지 IT 활동들을 활발하게 하고 있는 팀들이 있습니다. 그래서 그런 팀들과 기존에 어, 이런 대면 서비스를 했었던 교육, 공원, 여행 뭐 이렇게 했던 팀들과 좀 빨리 이런 상황에서 협업 어, 사업들을 만들어내고 그런 협업 과정이 어, 기존의 그 테크놀로지나 이런 것들 경험이 없는 사회적 경제 주체가 그런 전문 주체들하고 결합하면서 어떻게 빨리 이런 문제를 어, 해소할 수 있는지 이런 부분들을 좀 실험해 볼수 있을 것 같고 어, 이 과정에서 어, 대면 서비스를 중심으로 했던 사회적 경제 그 직원들이 빠르게 인력 교육이 가능해지는 이런 시스템들을 좀 동원을 해보면 이런 부분에서 실패와 성경 경험들이 있을 거 아니겠어요? 이런 부분들을 어, 기존에 어, 말씀하신 질문하셨던 그런 개도국의 사회적 경제 주체들이 어떻게 하면 이런 부분들을 협력하면서 같이 문제를 해결해 나갈 수 있을까 이런 경험들을 같이 어, 배우고 공유해 나갈 수 있지 않을까 이런 생각을 하게 됐습니다. 네, 고맙습니다. Thank you very much, Mr. Joe. I, I think this is the, our last um, question which was replied by Mr. Joe Julian and I know that there are some more questions which we could not reply to um, to you in time because we are re really behind of time but uh, we promise you that we will come back to you with a written reply to all questions as well as we will share uh, all the presentation of five speakers who have shared their very interesting and uh, inspiring 
experience and good practice developed by the um, organization and the city. I would like to uh, thank to all of you and especially to our speakers and attendees for participating very actively and contributing to the exchange of practice in today's webinar. And also we would like to invite you to stay with us in the coming days as we are going to have the second round of webinar on the recovery and development of this and work through SSC. The very first uh, series of this webinar will be in French on June 16th and then Spanish uh, on June 30th and um, English, um, oh, sorry, English is on June 30th. And I, I think that uh, some of the questions that you could not solve during this webinar could be treated during the second round of webinar in French and Spanish as well as in English. Our uh, Spanish one is scheduled on June 24th. So um, please stay with us and visit our website on regular base to be more updated and to be informed by um, GSEP Secretariat for the upcoming uh, other series of webinars. And very big thanks and, and gratitude to all our speakers as well as to our attendees. Thank you very much. Have a good day, have a good afternoon and have a good evening to you all. Thank you. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. To Mr. G, bye Mr. Bye. G. Bye. And, and Victor, thank you very much. Uh, we are very sorry for all the difficulties you have experienced today. <laughs> bye. Bye. Bye bye.